ah, technology is working for us. So welcome to those of you watching to the safe space where we learn how to train, feed, and heal our pets better. And today is an extremely important video because we're going to be covering a disease that impacts hundreds of thousands of pets every single day. And that includes pet allergies such as itchy skin, chronic ear infections, rashes, even loose stool and GI uh, upset with a nationally recognized fear-free certified veterinarian, Dr. Zach. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I'm very yeah, excited. I'm very excited. Um, who you also have um, special experience with emergency vet med, as well as um, dermatologic skin disease, allergies, etc. So it really is an honor to have you here. And uh, we're just going to jump straight into it today. Um, quick update for those of you watching that we do have an in-depth allergy comprehensive guide to go step-by-step -step through most of everything and even more. What we're going to talk about today, it'll be linked in the description below, which will also give you personalized online vet cons um, consulting access with Dr. Zach and team. So if you are looking for that more one-on-one -on -one support, uh, definitely click the link in the description below. But let's just jump into it, Dr. Zach. So how are you feeling today? I'm how feeling you great. Yeah. Yep. Working hard on the back end for something really cool. So I'm so excited. Finally, it's coming through. <laughs> yes, this has been a um, very long time in the making. So we're so excited yeah. for this. So Jumping into it, we're going to kind of start at the basics and work our way up because before we can really help share approaches and things to consider when it comes to your pet's allergies, it's really important that you understand what allergies are. And so let's start with Dr. Zach. What are allergies when we think about our in our pets? Yeah, so chronic allergies um, are actually in the very high majority of situations, your body reacting to normal things around it or your pet's body reacting to normal things around it, but in an inappropriate manner. So things that are technically not gonna hurt it. Um, it's reacting in this way that it's scared and it's creating these inflammatory responses um, through a different, you know, a different collection of cascades throughout the body. And then it's resulting in the symptoms that we see at the end. So um, these allergens or these stimuli that your body or your pet's body is seeing that are um, causing it to feel this way, most, if not almost all of them, are actually things that don't hurt you. Um, so it could be, you know, for example, we talk about pollen and we talk about, you know, dust mites in the air. You know, these things, these are things that aren't going to hurt you, but your body doesn't know that. And it's kind of um, acting inappropriately in the wrong way and causing the symptoms then that you or your pet feel. Yeah. And so essentially allergies, my understanding is that they are a state of overreactivity to an allergen, allergen being food, grass, chemicals by the immune system. So it's really at the immune immunity, immune system level. Is that correct? Exactly. Oops. At the end of the day, there you the go. system is um, along with the endocrine system, which is <laughs> along with with you know, your system, the body, and your cannabinoid system, um, are kind of your surveillance systems throughout the body, and you know your immune system is the mobile unit that's traveling all across, um, far and wide throughout your body every moment, and reacting, responding. So your skin, perfect, your gut um, are seeing things from the outside, and then your immune system is responding to it. Okay, um, and it, it seems like you're lagging just a little bit. Are you seeing that on your end, or? I'm wondering, or I'm wondering if it's just in the stream. I just want to see if anybody watching, if you could let us know if there's any bit of a lag. We'll keep moving because it's just very slight delayed, but we'll keep moving forward. Um, okay, so thinking about that, um, this is probably also why we are seeing, um, and I think you mentioned this, but it cut out a little bit, but why we see a common symptom as like loose stool or GI upset when it comes to allergies, even though we may not always correlate the two. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that, for sure. That you know, the body, you know, we don't think about it all the time, is um, reacting to things both on the inside and the outside that are um, external. And if you really think about it, your GI tract is just your skin and turned inside out in a way. And the cells that are surveying the environment around you are on both surfaces. So. Um, we talk a lot about this, the gut and, you know, the immune system that's there, but your skin um, has cells that are also surveying, responding as well in the same manner as your gut. 
Right. And what are some other common symptoms we would see with allergies uh, in our dogs and in our pets, really? So we, you know, we kind of talk a lot about the the skin stuff because that's the stuff we see the most. Um, but um, there's other things you can see as well um, that are equally um, contributory to kind of what the overall picture of allergies would be. So um, just to get out of the way, you know, the skin stuff we see. A lot of times it can be initially in conjunction with um, other things such as infections or overgrowth of normal commensal organisms like bacteria and yeast. But um, these are the things that we would see um, once we've kind of maybe cleared or checked for those. And then, you know, we're still seeing things in our pets. So um, the most common things we see with skin would be kind of like um, wind, itchy, um, cracked or flaky skin that... Um, doesn't have like little pustules or look like little pimples on them. It's kind of just red and itchy and it causes them problems. And you're like, I don't know, it's just kind of, it's, it's just a little red, but it's causing them a ton of pain and a ton of discomfort. Um, other things that you can see um, is uh, things that would involve maybe certain areas where it's um, darker moist. So you can see it like in the tail folds or you can see it inter digitally in between their toes. Um, so those are things that you can see sometimes some um, uh, moist uh, secretions or um, you can have some foul smells, et cetera. So um, those are things that you would see in the skin that we would um, commonly see. And I'm sure, you know, up to 35% of pet parents are seeing that on a pretty you know consistent basis based on stats of how many animals have allergies. So, um, but GI stuff also, um, which can um, suggest that your animal has a sensitivity or an allergy potentially um, are irregular stools or irregular bowel movements. And sometimes it's loose. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's in the middle. Um, excessive flatulence, feeling like you have to go. And one thing that a lot of people, um, you know, do see very commonly, actually, because I work in the emergency room a lot, is they'll see intermittent um, bloody stools. So um, something we see really commonly, and in in pets as compared to humans, is not always like a real concern. Like they don't have major hemorrhoids, like you know humans kind of think of in us. But that is a common thing we'll see when they have um, a level of colonic inflammation. Um, and then the third major category which humans actually deal with quite a lot as well um, is like ocular respiratory so your eyes and your nose so we can see um, chronic intermittent um, sniffles or clear discharge not like big goopy discharge but like clear serous thin discharge a lot of sneezing or um, intermittent coughing or hacking that um, otherwise you know if we've already tried to look for an infection we can't find it that they can also suggest um, immune dysregulation causing an, al an allergic response yeah. And I think, I don't, I don't know if you mentioned it or not. I was just making, checking to make sure the connection was good, which I think it's a lot better now people are saying, which is good. But um, I think, did you mention chronic ear infections as well and how that is usually indicative of, of something going on, potentially allergies? I didn't mention it. And that's great because we do see, um, you know, two different, two other conditions, which we kind of separated, but we do see two different things that um, are not, you know, considered a lot of times allergic responses, but they are. And that would be chronic ear infections. Um, specifically, if you keep going to your vet and they're like saying, you know, I don't really see much in there. There's a little bit of bacteria, a little bit of yeast, but it's not really that bad. But your dog at home is really suffering. Um, or we see anal gland problems. So their anal glands will get impacted. They'll get really itchy. Um, they'll express them a lot and they'll be scooting their butt all the time. So those are two conditions we often separate from like the allergic skin disease signs, but they are in many situations connected. Awesome. Yeah. I, I see, I see, and I hear that a lot. So I think I'm glad you covered it. And also one note, cause you mentioned going to your vet. One thing I like to say in all of these videos is that this video and this content, um, is not meant to replace, this is kind of a disclaimer, replace your current or local primary care veterinarians, uh, recommendations. We're simply sharing from an expert, uh, our personal approaches of how we would approach allergies in pets and the guide that we have, which is linked down below in the description, is an excellent resource for you to share with your veterinarian. Even this video would be a great resource to share with your veterinarian. So um, just want to make sure that's clear that we're not trying to treat, prescribe, give medical advice, et cetera. Um, okay. So we, we talked about the allergies, we, the symptoms. We talk about um, what allergies are. So what are the three most common causes of allergies? And then, yes, we will deep dive into, I'm getting quite a few questions about you know, what do we do? How do we address it? But let's talk about the three primary allergy inducing stimuli. Yeah, of course. So um, the first one is, um, seems a little obvious, but it's actually 
um, a bit more complicated than we make it, but um, the first would be fleas or flea um, saliva, actually. So um, what's interesting is that dogs um, can have tons of fleas and they're just a little itchy. But one dog that has a flea allergy dermatitis or is allergic to the fleas bite um, can have one flea and can be itching all over the place. So that's the first one we always try to check for and we always try to screen for and you know, try to um, use natural remedies to either rule or rule out. But um, that's the first one. And the second one is um, food sensitivities or um, specifically um, different molecules in food sensitivities um, that we can, that they can react to. So, um, you know, each category has their own. So for example, proteins, we often see, um, you know, we, the classic three are chicken, beef, and dairy. So those are the, the, the three we can see that dogs will develop over the course of, you know, a few years of their time. Um, but there are other categories. Um, so for example, soy is one we do see um, different um, other carbohydrate sources we can see. We don't sometimes do see um, sensitivities to components in gluten. It's not as common as I think we sometimes make it, I think, or maybe it is, but we haven't figured it out yet so much. But there are other components. But for the most part, we talk about different protein um, uh, components and the smaller molecules that make them up from certain sources. Um, in addition to that, just on the side note topic, a lot of times we also don't talk about the sourcing of the proteins we're getting. So the animal uh, meat where we're, we're sourcing it from also is obviously important as well and how the animal that our pet's eating um, was raised and what they were fed, et cetera. So that's the second component we might get into a little bit later. But um, And then the third um, is environmental, which is you know our third category, which is the hardest to control for because you know we're, we live on Earth. So... You know, there's things around us both inside and outside. So, you know, indoor would be you know, things like um, dust mites, house mites, um, fungi that can grow, mold, et cetera. And then outside would be your classic pollens and, um, you know, grasses and tree, um, well, I guess, tree pollens as well. So those are the three main categories. You got fleas, you got food, and you got the environment around us. Yeah. And I think a couple interesting things to go a tiny bit deeper on one of those being food and, you know, I've been doing a lot of these dog food reviews lately, and a lot of these ultra processed foods or kibbles uh, contain an ingredient called natural flavor or natural flavors. And My these, uh, yeah, <laughs> I know it's, it's right. uh, what are you hiding? <laughs> exactly. Like, why can't you just tell us what it is? Yeah. And what's, what's concerning about this is natural flavors. And this is according to the FDA is it can contain any meat. So it could be poultry, it could be beef, it could be seafood, it could be different essential oils. So if you're feeding a kibble that states that it's all beef or all chicken or all turkey, but it would have a different protein in there without ever disclosing that. So especially for dogs with sensitivities to certain proteins, I personally try to avoid natural flavors. And we'll talk more about foods in, in just a little bit, but wanted to call that out. Um, and then in terms of environment, you mentioned, you know, grass and, and dust mites and pollen. Another one, which we'll address later, are going to be common toxins in homes, like uh, that can really cause a lot of just irritation and sensitivities and increased inflammation, like common candles or air fresheners or for, you know, air sprays, things like that yeah. uh, can be really um, yeah. problematic. So um, let's jump into, since we're kind of talking about food, and this is one that I know a lot of people have questions on, which are around prescription pet foods and our thoughts about, um, or your thoughts really about prescription pet foods, concerns with them. Do you think they're helpful? Um, yeah, I think we'll go from there. Yeah. So prescription pet foods, <laughs> you know, we've talked about this, but <laughs> yeah, I know your, I know your thoughts, but the people want to know. <laughs> of course. So prescription pet foods, uh, just like pretty much any other fad that happens in, in the, um, in the food market, whether you're a human or an animal, right? Human foods go through fads as well. You know, we went through the, you know, South Beast fat flush diet, for example, is kind of like one we saw in humans, right? And everyone went on for it for five years. And then it was like, oh, my goodness, like, what, what are we doing? Um, so prescription foods, I think that um, are intended with good purpose. Um, I'll start with that, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a function out of a food, which technically is something that we believe in. Um, but of course, then we have to break it down in terms of what is a, a prescription food. So um, I find it odd that we can prescribe something that our bodies naturally need to survive. Um, so I think that the prescription food thing in and of itself is more predominantly a marketing tool versus it being something that um, makes sense logically in my brain. But what it's essentially doing is trying to serve a purpose. So when we talk about um, prescription allergy foods, um, what I do find a purpose for them actually really useful um, in, in many situations, especially if we're just in the beginnings of trying to figure out 
you know, does this animal have some type of infection we haven't found, a chronic infection, or is this really an allergy underlying that we have to address predominantly? Um, is to, um, once we've ruled out fleas as a potential cause, is to do an elimination diet trial and a, and a prescription food that um, has a novel protein or is, you know, um, hypoallergenic, I, I believe actually is something that potentially could be used in that situation. Is it the greatest option? It's, it's maybe not the greatest option if you can get something formulated or that's whole food. But in technical terms, I think that it is a way for us to, um, on the vet side um, and the pet parent side, figure out, am I really dealing with some type of food sensitivity or is this predominantly an environmental thing we have to deal with? So in that sense, I think as a diagnostic tool, they are helpful for if your doc vet was to um, recommend an elimination diet trial. Um, but in terms of long-term um, use as a, a food, I think uh, we would both agree that um, if you can, um, because sometimes people can't, but if you can, a whole food diet um, that is properly balanced um, and formulated would be a better option for long-term use. But um, so to summarize, I think the prescription food thing was a fad <laughs> that um, is extremely successful marketing, especially if the things are coming out nowadays with like brain diet, you know, like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and obviously we saw, you know, the the fears and the uprising and the fears of grain-free, et cetera. So I think that a lot of it is just is marketing um, that we find is good and or find is bad, et cetera. But um, long story short, as a diagnostic tool, I think that it can be helpful um, in some situations to determine if your animal is dealing with either food sensitivity or a collection of different allergenic situations um, or um, is not, but as a long-term tool, um, a long-term food, I'm not really sure if there are better options, if we can uh, afford them, we can um, put them into place. I think that those would be better options. Yeah. And I think what you said really stands out to me, which is for short, short, short term use. So I think what is concerning for me personally is when, um, so I, I get DMS and emails every single day of like, Hey, my conventional vet suggested I use a prescription pet food. My dog's doing a little bit better. So I'm just going to keep them on this food. And when the ingredients are, I have one of the ingredient panels in front of me right now of like a really common popular prescription pet food specifically for digestion allergy issues. And the ingredients are cornstarch, corn starch, hydrolyzed protein, powdered cellulose, which is essentially sawdust when you look into what cellulose actually is, yeah. soybean oil, and then a laundry list of synthetic vitamins. And so when somebody comes to me and says, hey, like, I don't really feel comfortable with these ingredients, I'm like, neither do I, <laughs> you know? So for long-term use, I think is my concern. But I think you make a good point that for short term to help identify if there is a specific food uh, sensitivity or ingredient intolerance, it could, it could be helpful. So, um, I think that's, that's, that will be helpful for a lot of yeah. people who are really stressed about putting their pet on a prescription pet food. I think to summarize, maybe what you were saying is like for yeah. short term could be great with the goal of getting them off into a whole food diet eventually. It's a diagnostic tool in my opinion and, and one that we can use, but, um, you know, if you can eat for the rest of your life, whether you're a dog or a cat, I think that that's the better option. Yeah. Probably you're cutting out again. Do you, you're, you're cutting out again. So do you have a way to plug in directly with the, I can edit this part out later, but do you have a way to plug in directly internet or because it's just lagging again, which is Love technology. It does this frequently, so don't worry. It happens, but anyways, while he's working on that, um, and for those of you who are watching on replay, I'll just edit this part out, which will be nice. But for those of you on live, thank you for um, all the kind words. Veronica, thank you. Thank you for that. That really means a lot for your kindness. Um, and I think and Dr. Zach, if you want to leave and come back, you can do that as well. But I think to summarize a little bit more with these um, prescription pet foods is I think another another concern and another pause reason to pause is a lot of um, is the way that these foods are sourced and processed. So if we look at the ingredients and we reach out to the manufacturer directly, you will actually find that they are feed grade foods, meaning they are made with ingredients that are deemed unfit for human consumption and feed grade foods, not always, but they can contain really low quality rendered 
ingredients, which means ingredients or meats that are a 4D uh, category, which means uh, meats or proteins that are, um, oh, here we go. Dr. Zach is back. Um, that could be disease, dying, or deceased. So that's another concern of mine. All right. Is that better for you on your end, I wonder? Test it. For me? Yeah. Uh, is it good? Yeah. You're blurry, but which is fine, but you're still a little, I know technology is fun. Um, well, I did. I, I took the audience poll and I tried the hotspot. So I'm hoping it's better. I don't know what's happening. We were talking so no. long before. I know. Well, it happens. Um, all right, let's just try it. Okay, we'll keep going. So, because I can edit this part out later, so it'll be totally oh, fine. It's still so, prescription, not as bad. Not as okay. bad. No, okay. and the audio sounds a lot better. So, okay. all right. well, and thank you, Ashley. Spot. Yeah, <laughs> hotspot. Okay. Ah, all right. So we back. This. Okay. <laughs> I know this is what this is, but you know what? Um, this is we're just being tested. You know, to it's probably big. It's probably big pet food coming after us. I bet. No. <laughs> um, okay. Let's okay. Let's talk about your thoughts on Apoquil, Cytopoint. We'll go a little bit into antihistamines, steroids, antibiotics, because these are really common approaches on the conventional vet side mm -hmm. uh, that are used every day. And I know that for me personally, as, as a researched pet parent, there's a lot of concerns with using these long-term. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the medications that you just listed there, which are you know five or six of the most common ones we see in conventional medicine, and those medications are um, a lot of times good at kind of trying to mute the symptoms that animals are struggling with, um, which is why they're created. Um, and they all have different mechanisms of doing that. But the problem is that none of them are really addressing what's the problem that we're at hand, at, that's at hand. And you know, like I said, once you rule out you know, the animal having infections or um, other conditions causing the symptoms that they're having, then the problem is rooted in excessive and inappropriate inflammation. So to kind of take um, an approach of just masking symptoms is, um, in my opinion, not the best way to approach it and, and that there are other options that we could try at least first. And, and so, you know, breaking down those medications that you just mentioned, um, each one of them um, through a different mechanism or a different process is going to try and block the um, symptoms that the animal is struggling with. So sp specifically and primarily itchiness. So, um, you know, Apoquel is a drug that you know, blocks a receptor and side point, which you know, out of the five, I would just, I would kind of say is the least concerning, but it's still has its interests. Um, it helps to block the um, one of the molecules that causes the itchy response, and then um, you know, steroids is talked about a lot, and it's basically an immunosuppressant, which helps you not itch anymore, but obviously is not um, ideal. And then um, you know, antihistamines, which are really Conventional antihistamines are not really helpful in veterinary medicine um, for animals. They can help with humans to a degree, but again, not not meant to be long term. And then antibiotics, obviously, you know, we talk far and wide about antibiotics. So all these medications that are prescribed in conventional medicine are kind of trying to mask symptoms and 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 do it in some collection of you know successful and not successful. But they're not addressing the root cause, in 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 our opinion, um, which is excessive inappropriate inflammation, um, and that's why most of them. Um, the success rate with them is, you know, usually somewhere between 70 to 75 percent of helping with reducing symptoms in some way, whether that's mild, moderate or um, completely. But um, again, they're not helping the animal and the body to get um, through this as best as possible. They're kind of just suppressing it. Yeah. And I think one thing we talk more in depth in in our guide is really are the differences between holistic or integrative approaches to allergies versus conventional. And these medications we just mentioned are really common uh, approaches in the conventional vet side. And what I think Dr. Zach, you've taught me is that um, these conventional approaches, as, as you mentioned, just to kind of summarize it are really focused on kind of treating or not even really treating, but like addressing the symptoms for like this kind of quick uh, improvement or quick results versus really understanding what this underlying root cause is. And then what can happen often, and I even see it in the comments here, somebody, a pet owner will put their pet on one of these medications, they see improvement, they're like, yay, we're good. And then it might be weeks or maybe even months later, 
all of a sudden symptoms come up or even different symptoms. And then they're trying to find another medication to treat that. And I think that kind of summarizes a big difference between holistic or integrative care, which is what your special specialty is in versus conventional, because on the holistic or integrative side, it's definitely more focused on identifying and addressing the underlying root cause. Is that a good summary? Yeah, for sure, actually. And that's why I, I like kind of being in the middle and integrative because I like to take the ideas and, and the successes of both sides versus, you know, failures, but, um, and you know, try to use them together to, in order to make pets happy and healthier. So um, I think that, you know, these medications have their place in, in certain situations and almost all of them would be short term again, kind of like the food we talked about before, where it can help you figure out a situation or it can help with an animal that's maybe really, really severely struggling. And we're trying a lot of things already that are natural and holistic that these medications are, the goal is to live a happy, healthy life. And so you know, if you're struggling really bad for a short period of time, then using Cytopoint one injection maybe on a really bad year and it's just causing this animal tons of discomfort, then you know, you don't you can't kill yourself over that because it's just this animal needs it and they need help. But if we can try a lot of things prior to that and try to address the root cause, then I think that that's kind of a better route to start with um, until we've exhausted you know, most, if not all of our options in that sense. Yeah. And I think that's one reason I really love learning from you because you're not so extreme on either side that you're kind of open to learning from both the really conventional and the really holistic side, and then taking what's best for the animal in that moment, because every pet is different and then addressing that. And I think that's really for me as a, as a, as, as a pet owner, I mean, for my own health, that's kind of how I approach, right? I try to go more natural holistic, but if I'm going to have, I don't know, surgery or something like, and I need to have anesthesia or whatever it might be, I'm going to take that modern medicine approach to keep myself comfortable. So I, I'd want the same uh, for my pets. Um, and one interesting thing, I put this in our guide, but I'll read it here. It's actually a, the direct quote from the FDA, specifically on Apoquel. They put the Apoquel may increase the chances of developing serious infections and may cause existing parasitic skin infestations, pre-existing cancers to get worse. Most yeah. common side effects are vomiting and diarrhea. So I think another thing you kind of alluded to is that these medications may help one thing, other, there could be a whole host of other side effects that are harmful long-term. Um, so it may end up not even be worth being worth it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, classically is the steroids. So steroids are fantastic at making something, make, making your itch go away, you know, right. And whether it's topical, whether it's oral, you know, we've seen that time and time again, but the side effects that come with that using it long-term or using it multiple times throughout a year, um, it, the immune suppression that happens, it definitely, I think, has a toll on the body um, in more ways than one. Um, same goes for antibiotics, like we talked about, you know, time and time again, not just with me. You've talked with several people on, on, you know, on here about that. But um, the Abiquel is something that came on the market as like this miracle drug, I feel like, for a lot of veterinarians and pet parents that were, you know, finally happy there was some relief that wasn't a steroid. And, uh, you know, I, I guess it'll take time for us to collect the data uh, on the public sense. But if the FDA is already writing something about it, that's a good sign because I've actually talked to a lot of even conventional veterinarians and um, specifically conventional oncologists that are seeing in dogs that have been on lymphoma long term certain types of cancers earlier than they've ever seen in a more frequent basis than would, considered be, would, than would be considered coincidental. Um, so I think Apoquel is a drug that we need to um, be really careful with using um, in more than just a very short kind of tapering sense, maybe once a year or wait once every other year if we're having a difficult time. Um, yeah, that's my piece on yeah. that. Oh, okay, so time. yeah, I know it's, it's, a, it's a sensitive topic and we, you know, disclaimer, every dog is different, you know, work with your local vet. Um, but I think it's important really my intention and my purpose of the co all the content I make is to help curious pet parents, like these pet parents who are just desperate to be able to, to know what the best thing is for their pet to become informed. And that way you're making a decision for your pet ba uh, that you're comfortable and confident with, not just because one person said this or another person said that, like you're informed right. on all sides. So let's talk about some of the top ways and most effective ways on the integrative and holistic approach to um, address pet allergies. What do you? What is the first thing you look at with a pet? 
Um, so, you know, we, it's hard. So, you know, first, first, obviously the most important thing, whether you're a conventional vet, an integrative vet, a holistic vet is to look for um, comorbidities or other things that could be causing the symptoms they're having. Right. So, um, you know, classically, um, skin infections, um, bacterial overgrowth in the gut, et cetera, we have to address those first. So, um, so that would be, you know, the process, whether you are, uh, you know, any, any vet you're seeing, whether it's your regular vet you've had for years or, you know, you're looking to get a second opinion from someone, you know, we're going to have to address the things that are and, and technically easier to treat, right? Because those are, those are things we can address and, and many times we can cure, right? So yeah, that would be the first step. Uh, we've already kind of gone through that and we're on our next recheck and you know, we're like, we were, did all these things and we've done them properly. Then, you know, kind of start with a lot of things that you've already um, talked about, you know, on here with other, um, you know, experts is that, you know, it's no secret that the majority of our immune system is in our gut. So um, whether you're a human, dog, cat, doesn't matter. Um, starting with um, addressing your diet and looking for things that are going to dysregulate the immune system that's there and that's surveying 24-7 is going to be the first step to really addressing any type of condition that we think is immune-mediated based because um, the immune system is acting in a dysregulated fashion if we're right. And so we have to help train our immune system to not do that anymore. So um, that's something, obviously, I know that you're super you know, passionate about and um, talk about all the time, <laughs> whether it's a live or another video. And, and, and it's, you know, kind of really in instituting that fresh whole food diet in the proper way that it's going to be balanced um, in its macro and micronutrients, which is the most important thing. Because um, although we talk about kibble being dangerous, the most dangerous diet in the world is an improperly balanced um, whole food diet, because that's technically what kibbles were made is to balance the diet even if it's in minimum requirements and with synthetics, that was a job. So um, we need to have a balanced diet over the course of, you know, not every single day, but over the course of, you know, a period of time. And that's why kibbles came into fashion other than the ease of it is because they're technically easy and balanced. So um, if we can go through the measures of balancing um, over a grand scheme of, you know, a time period, balancing our diet with fresh whole foods, then absolutely that's the best way to go. But if it's improperly balanced with deficiencies, then that's the most dangerous diet, actually. So, but to answer your question directly, it's obviously addressing the diet, which, um, you know, you've, you've, you've hit, hit time and time again with other experts as well as, you know, on other videos. Yes, I am very passionate about pet food. And um, I think that, you know, you, you're so right in that um, it's, you know, we, we, Try, like I think a lot of times people think that I'm like anti kibble, which by no means, and I don't think you are either. I think we're more anti kibble only or anti um, at least exploring um, fresh food options because yeah. if we look at what's biologically or species appropriate for dogs. We know that minimally processed whole foods um, are really optimal, and that's you know same for you and I, right? So right, exactly. I think it's more of kind of using common sense, but yeah, I agree. Like using, and not just, um, actually we do have a recipe in our guide, which is linked below. If, if you guys yeah, want to yeah. try one that, that is formulated by Dr. Zach. So, uh, so it, there you go. You can get a complete and balanced one, but I think working with a veterinarian or pet nutritionist that is experienced in formulation is really important because not every nutritionist and not every veterinarian are experienced with formulating a diet. So if you do want to do DIY, then I think finding one who has that experience, but an easier route is just finding a complete and balanced, ready-made, pre-made right. diet. You can, you can purchase online or, or, um, or in a store and we have ours listed, our favorites listed down below. Um, Which okay. So we're going to you know like 10 years ago, even maybe eight to 10 years ago, right? Like there are yeah. companies that are popping up that are, you know, being, um, the, the diets are being formulated by veterinarians. They have a team of sometimes like nutritionists as well on board that are making these diets. That wasn't an option, you know, maybe eight to 10 years ago even. So that's amazing that we have that option because DIY can be tough. Not that I, you can't do it. I know you do it. <laughs> so, you know, you're awesome. <laughs> but it's <can be> tough. <laughs> yeah. Some people have busy lives. They can't cook for their pets all the time, which yeah. I totally understand. You know, I, I'm, I'm on the road all the time. I couldn't cook for a pet either. So, you know, I get it. So they, we have the properly formulated diets now that are not, kibble base that are, um, you can purchase that are, that have, you know, different expert vets on the back end that are making them. So, um, and that goes between a raw, lightly cooked, freeze dried, et cetera. So there's numerous options, um, that you can choose from. And again, all, all I really care about is that the diet is properly balanced, both in macro and micronutrients, because that's, that's what our bodies need. 
Yeah, for sure. So we talked about food. What about nutraceuticals or supplements? And we won't go through each one, but can you talk a little bit about how the kind of what these are? Because I know I didn't know the term nutraceutical before learning from you. So I'm excited to kind of share that with the world at like kind of a high level. And then um, maybe how these can be helpful in a pet's journey to um, relieving allergy symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, nutraceuticals, although I mean, the word kind of sounds interesting, I guarantee some, most, if maybe not almost all the people that are here today and that will watch these videos have used them. They just didn't know they were using them. But, um, you know, a nutraceutical, basically, it, it's a derivation, uh, you know, nutrition and, and, and a pharmaceutical, which is like almost like a, you know, a, a drug kind of word, but, um, or suffix. But um, essentially, they're just supplements that we use that are naturally derived most of the most of the time, if not almost all the time, they're derived from a food or a food substance. Um, and most of the time, but not all the time, they're in a concentrated form. So essentially, they're um, like extracting the um, nutrient density aspects of a food um, and then applying them as um, a therapy and as a supplement. So um, so a, a great example, one that you know I, I recommend all the time uh, would be like non-psychoactive medicinal mushrooms. So you're taking mushrooms that um, have um, holistic aspects and have... Um, amino modulatory aspects um, and adaptogenic aspects, and you're taking them and you're extracting them and you're um, you know, concentrating them in a pill or a powder or a capsule, and then you're taking it as a supplement. So nutraceutical is just, you know, in, in, the, in, you know, in a Cliff Notes fashion, is a naturally derived, usually naturally food-derived um, supplement that helps with um, helping advance our, our health and wellness. So, um, so again, people that are watching your channel, a lot of them are holistically or, or naturally focused. And so you know, that was just one I mentioned, but there's a variety of them. So for example, I, I you know, I really love um, endocannabinoid system um, balance and homeostasis. So a full spectrum CBD extract um, derived from, you know, a cannabis plant or hemp plant is another example of a nutraceutical that um, comes from a food because hemp is actually a food um, and a plant. And that's a use that you can use for promoting anti-inflammatory, immune modulatory, and endocannabinoid system health. So, um, yeah, we're not going to go through all of them because our, our guide does list, gosh, I'm going to tell you, almost like 20 to 30 that not yeah. all of them. I don't want everyone to think that we're, you're supposed to apply them all right now. But um, once you've addressed diet um, and maybe we're still experiencing symptoms some some part of the year or all the year, then, you know, working in a stepwise fashion of where those symptoms are, we've kind of listed, um, you know, a, a few of our favorites on there that you can start working through. Um, and trying and also talking to your vet about you know, and re doing your own research on because, um, you know, the one caveat that comes with supplements that are not FDA um, regulated is that um, is sourcing. So when I when I do talks uh, at conventions all the time about cannabis, I'm like, listen, we know this plant works, but it's not the plant you should be fearful or not. It's the people that then take the plant and put it in your mouth or on your skin that you need to be fearful of because it's the human element that makes it from being this beautiful substance to something that can either have no active ingredients or even have har harmful ingredients. And that's, that's what we have to do. So you always have to do your own research no matter what, um, if you're looking to get a nutraceutical um, on your own and, and or supplement. Yeah. Um, sourcing, and that, that's the same for food. <laughs> for, yeah. Where your food is sourced from uh, directly impacts uh, how it influences the cells and organisms organisms in, in your body. So, so we talked about diet being really important in addressing uh, in addressing your pet's allergies. I think a second one would be working with a holistic vet or integrative vet directly, even if it's in supplement or in addition to your conventional vet, because I think I'm getting a lot of comments like, well, my vet tried this, my vet tried that. Right. And I think, you know, anybody watching this, I want you to feel confident and comfortable and safe to seek alternative opinions. Dr. Zach has options, which will be linked down below as well, but, or you can go simply to AHVMA, American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association.org, and they have a complete find a vet section and it'll have, yeah. vets listed that are of integrative or holistic minded all around the country. So I think working with one directly is important. Um, another one would be topical therapies. We can talk a couple bit about that. And I do want to, I forgot to mention earlier yeah. um, that you are <laughs> founder and creator of the first ever human grade luxury skin care shampoo pet grooming brand. Yeah. Um, I forgot to mention no. that. <laughs> <laughs> it is because it is, I mean, it is, it is all that and more. And 
uh, when I came across this, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is incredible. And then when I tried it on my own pets, um, one of it, you know, he struggles on and off with environmental allergies. I was like, this stuff is really powerful. Um, and the ingredients are unlike anything I've ever seen, very pure. Um, and it's obviously vet formulated in partner. You also work with an expert herbalist, I think, is that the right term? Yeah, she's um, amazing. She's like one of those people that are like a genius, but she doesn't know it. Like she's this amazing woman, um, super just genuine. Um, but her background is she's been doing for almost 40 years um, holistic paramedical esthetician work. So she basically works with human surgeons who are conventional doctors um, and they trust her to basically hand over the post-operative treatment plan for um, mostly like plastic surgery. So things that have very, um, you know, your, your skin needs to heal 100%. So you go back to looking normal. She is trusted by conventional doctors, holistic doctors, anyone in between to take over the care of these, these, these um, humans in order to make them back to being 100% healthy um, externally. So um, I was lucky to have found her uh, serendipitously through, you know, a friend of a friend and we were friends for years. And then, you know, one day I was like, you know, you've been doing this for, for, for humans. Let's see if we can do this for animals too, because, you know, she, four decades is something, you know, I'm not even four decades old yet. So, <laughs> you know, she's been doing yeah. this and, you know, ex ex you know, becoming an expert in the craft for a, an amazingly long time. So, um, and, you know, with a little tweaking, she had, you know, formulas kind of pre-made and we tweaked a couple of things, the essential oils, you know, we, we really address those because essential oils, you know, huge myth online that essential oils are all bad for pets. Absolutely not. Um, but you do have to find the right concentration um, in order to make them healthy and not um, pose an irritant to the animals because, you know, dogs are smelling 25,000 times more things than we are. So, you know, we have yeah. to make it so that it's, it's, it's not going to irritate them, but at the same time you can use them therapeutically. So, um, with, you know, over a year of work and, you know, editing, you know, kind of formulas that were already there, but needed a little bit of, um, I guess, adjusting and adapting to the pet space. We worked together and made something that is just first tier now. I can't wait for, we're working on a second tier of products right now, but, um, and it's super important because we don't, you know, we talk about gut all the time, like we just talked about, but you know, if you're dealing with an allergic dog, you have to address the outside and the inside of the dog. So topical therapy is something that we don't want to talk about much. And I was like, good, you know, we need to take this by the reins. So let's do this. And that was the goal of Naked Pet was to you know, complement the, um, the uh, I guess, treatment plan or the therapy plan that you would work with with animals that are really struggling uh, for a while. And we haven't quite figured out all the pieces yet. Yeah. I think you're so humble talking about it. It really, there really is nothing else out there like this. And I've um, researched every, every topical product for pets that is possible. <laughs> um, and <laughs> you know, the fact that you have two incredibly, um, brilliant people behind this product, I think, um, when you, when those of you watching, I'll, I'll have it linked in the description, it's called naked pet. I don't even know if I said that. Um, but when you, when you look at the ingredients, you'll see a complete difference from what, um, any other product out there has. And I think a couple things I want to say about Naked Pet, because um, there's a lot of, I think, misconceptions. We should do a whole live on actually looking at different brands without showing the brand, but like comparing just so yep. people can make educated decisions. But a couple things that's like really important when you're using a more natural holistic product, like a shampoo or conditioner, um, you're not going to get the same like sudsy foamy. It does a little bit, but not as much with this really strong, potent, like vanilla or cupcake scent, because yeah. then of that, the, all the ingredients to make soaps and shampoos the way they are traditionally are known irritants can be toxic and are not naturally derived. So, um, what they've done is they've took, they've taken, like you said, human grade, vegan, really luxury ingredients that are hundred percent human grade. Um, and created a really therapeutic and potent uh, skin product that can be used for bathing. Whether you bathe your dog every other week or you bathe them every three months, it can be used in, in any way. So, um, but that is a really good way. So to kind of back up on treating allergies in general, I thought for many years that dogs should only be bathed like six times a year because otherwise it's going to strip our, all of their oils. But I later learned that um, yes, that can happen if you use a really low quality shampoo or conditioner, but if you use a human grade pet safe and specific shampoo or conditioner like naked pet, you can actually bathe them more regularly and actually can be helpful to allergens 
to allergies because it can wipe off and rinse off the allergens like po uh, pollen. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, you know, we alluded to it before, but um, dogs that are having immune dysregulation, whether it's um, the gut, uh, the skin or both or something else, we, we need to address the surfaces everywhere. So, um, you know, your dogs that are allergic, your cats that are allergic, they're developing things that are sticking to them all day, whether, you know, the classic is in between the toes after we've just been running outside for, you know, an hour or more. And, you know, we don't think about it, but they're running through allergens through that whole time. Not every dog, if not, you know, the majority of dogs will not respond to those allergens, but some are. So they're sticking to them all the time. Their, their, their cells are reacting to these all the time. And so we need to um, understand that our, the body is always alive and always thinking and always watching. So you know, we talk about human grade products for the gut all the time, right? But we don't really talk about human grade products for the skin all the time, which is the second half of addressing dogs that have skin infections, ear infections, allergies in any location, um, autoimmune, other autoimmune conditions, et cetera. So that's why we made this is because we're not talking about the whole picture. We're talking about the majority of it, but we need to talk about the second half of it. Um, so, um, so other, you know, topical therapies that I would use in the past in order to help, um, almost, uh, detox the skin, right. Um, which, um, I'd recommend more than just once every two months, like you just mentioned, um, is literally just, you know, rinsing your dog down with warm water after being outside for a couple hours or um, doing um, foot soaks with, um, you know, you can steep black tea or do Epsom salt or, you know, have lavender or, or copaiba um, or frankincense, you know, um, essential oils in there that they just dip their feet in when they come in. Or um, one of the naked pet products that's on there is um, a true, because that's an important word, but a true um, colloidal silver that has been tested for, um, elemental versus ionic purity. So colloidal silver um, is kind of like copper where, you know, people have copper surfaces in their house that are antimicrobial. Silver is extremely similar in a sense, but it's safe for our bodies to be exposed to it, whereas copper is not. So in that, in that, in that manner. So, um, you know, colloidal silver is useful for things like in the ears or in the tail folds or, you know, between the toes, even in the eyes. And you can even swallow colloidal silver, honestly, um, which, um, some people use as a therapy. So, um, you know, ultimately, um, when it comes down to shampooing, conditioning, or treating topically, we, that theory, I think, has come from when we use harsh chemicals or things that are not um, human grade. So um, most of the shampoos we talk about have um, either uh, benzoyl peroxide in them or um, chlorhexidine or, you know, um, pharmaceutical antifungals in them. Like that stuff is tough on your body if you're going to do that, um, you know, twice a week because... And your body's not used to that kind of level of potency. We're just killing everything off. You know, we're not thinking about the body as being alive in that sense. We're thinking about just killing everything and then trying to wipe it, wipe the surface clean, which is, I don't, I don't think that that's the best approach we can take. Yeah. Um, that's, ugh, I'm, I, I think that is because when I talk about that, like bathing more frequently, people's minds are just blown. They're like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't think I could do that, but it just matters. The products you use or honestly don't use it seems. Um, and so we're getting close to time. God, we've covered so much so quickly. I'm just like, there's so much more to cover. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about, I hate using this word because it usually hurts on the algorithm, but um, we'll call, well, vaccines or vaccinations, we'll just say it. Uh, but these are a controversial topic, but I think it needs to be addressed about kind of some of your thoughts on this. I ask every veterinarian um, I connect with their thoughts on vaccinations. Um, I know you're not like, anti-vax by any means, but I know that you have um, some thoughts around, you know, the the amount and the type, um, which are aligned with with my thoughts as well. So do you, can you talk a little bit about these and, and why this matters as it relates to pet allergies? Yeah, for, you know, and just as a disclaimer, because like you mentioned in the beginning, yes. I, I'm, I work predominantly emergency medicine. So I see, unfortunately, a lot of the young animals are things that I guess the anti-vaxxer or, you know, the not um, prioritizing the understanding of the importance of some things that are not holistic, you know, because the advancement of medicine in certain areas was important. We have diseases, diseases that we can prevent now through vaccination, which are, which is critical to animals being able to live happy, healthy lives. And that's why we're all here. So um, I do see, unfortunately, some of the stories where animals weren't vaccinated at all. And, you know, through different means, they, um, they do then succumb to diseases, which I believe are preventable. However, at the same time, what I like to do with animals, I just want to take the approach that we do in humans, because in humans, we seem to be 10, 20 years ahead all the time, whether it's diet, whether it's medications, whether it's holistic therapy, whether it's fads, et cetera. So we're always 10, 20 years ahead, I feel like, in the human space. And in the human space, 
for example, I'm a doctor. I have to get rabies titer tested, you know, every three to 10 years, depending on what my job is. Why are we not doing that in pets? And why are we just blindly vaccinating animals and saying, oh, it's better off that we give them more than less? We're not doing that in humans. Why are we doing that in animals? I don't understand it. So I, I like to take the approach that I'm like, all right, let's think about this logically, right? You know, if this animal has an immune system, there's a, it's not remembering that it has rabies, but maybe it is. And maybe we can test for that. So titer testing, we do that in humans all the time. Why are we not doing this in animals? Was it too expensive or just did someone just not want to do it? Or was it easier to vaccinate more? Who knows what the theory is behind it. But um, in my view, which um, you had Dr. Ruth Roberts, who name dropped, I love Dr. Roberts, so you had her on recently, um, and she described the exact, you know, kind of uh, process or um, theory behind how I think of vaccinations as well, because the person that has been studying this, the guy who's the expert, Dr. Rob Schultz, who works in one of the vet schools, he's been trying for decades to help the um, associations and the veterinary world see what really logically makes sense in these animals. And so he's dedicated his whole life to this, and he has studies and papers, et cetera, that are even actually written in some of the, um, I think the, it's the World Small Animal, or it's the um, uh, American Hospital Association, is written in there and still we don't follow it. So it's like crazy to me that yeah. this book has worked to prove the, log the logical aspect of uh, vaccinations behind it. And so I don't subscribe to um, the hyper vaccination to be safer than sorry. I think that that's, doesn't make sense, both um, logically as well as health, health beliefs for these animals. I think the hyper stimulation is something we are having a tough time proving because you need a lot of money to go into proving prospective studies. And, and that would be weird to also have, you know, create a group of hyper stimulated animals that then you know you're subjecting them to potentially being unhealthy. So it's hard to prove these things through studies. So I think empirical um, information does have its place in a lot of aspects where a lot of times we'll, we'll discredit that. But um, all in all, just to answer the question, um, you know, vaccines early in life in order to teach the immune system that these things are bad, I think it's important. And um, after that, after that one year of age period, then vaccinating uh, titer vaccinations, I'm sorry, vaccine titers, got dyslexia, um, vaccine titers um, are logical and we should be using them in order to determine if we need more vaccinations. And um, that is for the core series that, you know, is recommended for dogs. When it comes to the non-core vaccines, it, it becomes very situational um, depending on where your animal's living or what they're exposed to or what their lifestyle's like, if they're outside all the time or they're inside non-core is a whole different conversation. But when it comes to the core vaccines themselves, you know, juvenile one year and then vaccine titer testing for the rest of their life makes sense until we prove that they need another vaccine. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I learned from the same sources. So I loved that we had kind of similar um, thoughts on this. And I think it's important to, um, I guess, also we didn't really define kind of what titer tests were. So for anybody watching, um, a titer test is essentially an antibody test that's going to help determine a dog's immunity essentially to a disease instead of just vaccinating. Because what's happening is dogs are getting vaccinated every year or every other year just automatically when they already may essentially be immune to that disease. So there's really no benefit to over vaccinating. So um, a titer test, which which is amazing, and we linked it in our guide, um, has become so much more affordable because titers used to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars for yeah. vet or pets. But now there's several, like three or four resources yeah. where you can get it for half that, if not a quarter of that cost now. So it's definitely becoming more accessible as well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so I think that, gosh, that was, that's a lot of good stuff. I think what we'll end with is a reminder that next week, and we'll do this more than once, but next week we'll be doing an Ask a Vet series where we're going to allow you guys to submit your specific questions and we will not be giving medical advice. Rather, we will be taking the information you provide and we'll be giving some general thoughts and approaches around that situation that you can then take to your veterinarian. But we want to share that um, live with everybody so that people with similar experiences can kind of learn from that. Um, again, you can also find our comprehensive allergy guide that goes in, it's 40 pages, <laughs> very in-depth, step-by-step. Crazy how long that came out to be. <laughs> yeah, Allergies I are know. complex. <laughs> they are, they are. And it's an incredible resource again, for you to share with your local primary care veterinarian. So we're not using this as a way to replace anybody. Instead, this is a resource to help you advocate for your pet and to help you 
feel really confident in the decisions you're making uh, for your pet. Dr. Zach, are there any um, lasting suggestions, recommendations, um, words of encouragement for those watching that are just overwhelmed, but starting to feel like there's hope? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, it's tough because, you know, a lot of times, whether you're online or you're watching videos just like this, or you're reading things, it's super tough to know what to do, where to start, and, you know, what's the right thing you're doing for your pet. And you have to remember that doing one thing is better than doing nothing. So if you're doing one thing, you're doing two things for them. You're doing great, okay? It's it's not about I have to go 100% this way starting today. Otherwise, I'm failing as a pet parent and I'm watching my animal suffer in one way or another. That's, that's not what this is about. This is about um, working in a stepwise fashion logically in order to try and use what nature has provided us in a way that will help us and our pets to become healthy and happy in the long term. And so, you know, taking this talk, taking other talks by other, you know, experts in the field and trying to implement one thing at a time um, and or, you know, helping to talk to your vet and saying, like, I really want to try this, you know, how would be the best way to do it? Doing those measures is the best thing you can do one step at a time. So um, I know it could be overwhelming because it's, you know, it's over, it was overwhelming when I learned about this. I mean, I graduated vet school and, you know, I'm taught one certain way. And then over the last five, six years, you know, I've had to learn through hearing things and then my own interests and then my own fears. And then now, you know, now being able to grasp it in a way um, that makes sense to me, that's that it takes time. And it's not something that you have to be discouraged or distraught about, um, especially if in the process, you're still having to use pharmaceuticals on our intermittent or an intermittent or a consistent basis while we're figuring things out. So you, you have to be your best friend. You have to know that you're doing the best you can. And as long as you're doing one thing and another thing in a slow, progressive fashion at the pace you can and at what you can afford, that you're doing a great job. And as long as you keep up with it and you're trying your best, then don't get discouraged. Be excited that you are one of the few pet parents that is trying to do the best for your pet in a way that the 21st century allows us. Um, so I guess that was a long winded way of saying that was, you know. that was beautiful. I love it. <laughs> um, and that, and it aligns so much with what I always tell owners that reach out because they're usually distraught. They're usually overwhelmed, feel hopeless. And I just tell them that like the fact that you're here, you're watching this, you're listening shows that you are doing more than 99% of pet parents out there. And I love how you said, um, love yourself like your best friend or something it inspired a new saying I think I might use, which is like, I'm trying to think of it. Love, love your, love yourself the way that your dog would love you. I think is, I might have to steal that saying something to that effect because uh, great market. Probably. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> cause, cause you're right. Like you watching this, you are doing more than most and you just, there's, you know, there's going to be hiccups and things. And um, and again, if you, if you get our guide, which is linked down below, that gives you access um, to a personal consult with Zach and his telehealth online team, which is, um, which is incredible. And we're so grateful for it, um, at an extremely discounted price. Now I'm going to say this cause this video is evergreen. That is probably limited time. Cause I bet your calendar is going to get full really quickly, uh, because of your <laughs> expert knowledge here, but, um, for now it's there. So definitely don't wait on that. So with that, thank you, Dr. Zach for being here. Um, it is a true honor to learn from you. Your mind is just, I don't think you realize like the impact you've already had on my life and now on everybody watching this. So we are grateful for you and your